Today's encore presentation comes from Season 5 of Heart to Heart with Anna. This was the very first episode from Season 5. It is entitled A Twin Miracle and features heart mom Kathy Kolodinsky. She discusses the miracle of a twin birth and having a twin with an undiagnosed critical congenital heart defect and how both twins are doing now. I hope you enjoy today's special encore presentation, A Twin Miracle. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to the fifth season of Heart to Heart with Anna. Our theme this season is Miracles Do Happen. And we have a great story today. Many of us in the heart world believe in miracles because our babies are evidence to us that miracles can happen. As if the miracle of birth were not enough to make a person awestruck in our situation, having a baby born with a heart defect, it's even more apparent than ever that each and every child is a miracle. Couple that with many couples' difficulty in conceiving or a couple who has already experienced the death of a child or a baby, and the miracle of the birth of a child is quite evident. For many of us in the heart world, however, miracles may look a bit different. It may be a choice that we made that took us to a certain place at a certain time to be with the right people who could do something extraordinary. That was the case with today's guest. Our show today, A Twin Miracle, will feature heart mom Kathy Kolovinsky. Kathy is a homeschooling mom to six energetic children, Zach, 11, Dominic, 8, Mia, 7, Eli, three, and Ethan and Lucas, one-year-old twins. She also has a bonus daughter from her husband's first marriage, Tasha, 16. One of Kathy's twins, Ethan, was born with an obstructed total anomalous pulmonary venous return and required emergency open-heart surgery at 11 hours of age. He had an amazing recovery and went home after only three and a half weeks. We'll be learning a lot more about Ethan in our show today. Welcome back to Heart to Heart with Anna, Kathy. Hi, thanks for having me back. Well, some of you may remember that Kathy was on another show where we talked about twins. And so I always love having these fabulous guests come back and share a little bit more of the story. So I'm really happy that you could be here. And I've so enjoyed reading your blog. You're a very natural mother. And I have a lot of friends who are like that since I was also a homeschooling mom for many years. So I'm in sync with how you are a homeschool mom and providing an organic learning environment for your children. And one thing that you've done that I never did do was to have a home birth. So can you tell us about what it was like to have a home birth and what is involved with that? Uh, what's involved? It's really not, actually, no, it is really different than <laughs> having a hospital. It's not that different in that you, know, you see a midwife the same way you would see your OB. Because I live in a midwife-friendly state, you can easily get all of the same prenatal testing that you would have if you were with an OB. So the prenatal care is very comparative to what you would have in an OB's office. You do have to get more supplies but when your baby comes, and you would if you were in a hospital because they have supply the, the chucks pads and you don't have to worry about messing up their mattresses. I typically shoot for water birth, so we always need to find a place for the pool and make sure it's set up and ready to go and then keep the kids from using it as a trampoline. <laughs> the midwife brings everything. They like to bounce because it inflates in the bottom, so they like to bounce on it. The midwife brings whatever metal equipment we might need, um, you know, dapplers to monitor mm-hmm. the baby, oxygen supplies for mom and baby, supplies if there's a hemorrhage, anything that a freestanding birth center would have, she brings in the trunk of her car. One of the things that I really love about home birthing is that I don't have to go anywhere. There's no question as Mm -hmm. to whether it's time to leave or we're going to go in too soon or we're going to go in too late and have the baby on the side of the road. I get to be comfortable in my own space, in my own familiar surroundings with people that I'm familiar with, my care providers that know me, and they come to me. I don't have to make Mm -hmm. that unpleasant car ride. Midwives clean everything up. They come and check on you several times after the birth. You get to move into life as a new family right from the get-go. Our older children Mm -hmm. were actually awake to see our youngest born, and they loved it. It was amazing for them to get to see that. It's kind of hard to describe what it's like. You know, I'm not going to lie, it's hard work and it hurts. (laughs) There's there's no epidurals at home. Mm. But working through that process in your own space with people that you've chosen to surround yourself with is incredibly powerful. After our first home birth, my husband kept saying over and over, I can't believe we actually did that. I can't believe we just did that. Partially probably because it actually wound up being unassisted. 
by accident, but it was just really amazing for both of us, and he's one of the biggest homeless dads you'll ever meet now. Wow. Well, you make it sound exciting, and I don't know, like it's supposed to be that way. You know, that's kind of how we feel it is. It's a very different experience, having had both. The feelings are different when you're in your own space versus having to go somewhere else. So Mm -hmm. we kind of feel like it is supposed to be that way. Hospitals are kind of newfangled when it comes to babies. Really, if you think about history as a whole, hospitals are kind of the new place. Um, People were having babies at home long before there were hospitals, and it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. It sounds amazing. It sounds like it was more relaxing to be in your own environment with your family all around you and without the serialness that's involved. But I'm married to a nurse. I would worry about all the germs. (laughs) There's actually, if you think about it, there's actually germs in your home that you're used to and that are you already acclimated to them and your system's acclimated to it. And hospitals are kind of where a lot of sick people go. <laughs> so yeah, they don't have mercy at home true. and they have mercy in hospitals. There are pluses and minuses to both, and I think women should really go mm. where they feel most comfortable and where they feel safest. And for me, the majority right. of the time, that's been at home. So how many home births have you had, Kathy? I have had three. Three. My births. first was in the hospital, and then the next three were all at home, and then the twins were in the hospital. And so initially you intended for this birth to also be a home birth, I'm guessing, and your OB discovered there were twins. So can you tell me what it was like when you discovered that you were pregnant with twins? To say we were shocked would be an understatement. We found out almost right away at our nine-week ultrasound. I had had a fairly nasty miscarriage, and so we got early ultrasounds to make sure everything looked good. And I knew before that appointment was even over, we were going to have an issue with the birth. Our midwife does not catch twins. And that issue, completely aside, even though I was carrying the safest kind of twins, neither Joe nor I were completely comfortable having them at home because we were 40 minutes from the hospital we would want to go to if there was a problem. Mm -hmm. Being in the hospital was simply not an option for me at first. I wasn't even willing to consider it because I had some pretty serious trauma from my son's first delivery, which left me with post-traumatic stress and postpartum depression. So our focus at first was to stay out of the hospital for the twins. It took about a month for us to get things set to have the babies at a birth center that was closer to the hospital with another midwife who had experience with twins. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks after we kind of got everything set up with her, she backed out on us without any real explanation. Um. We just sent me an email saying that she was no longer available for March. So we were pretty upset. I was devastated because she was really our only option outside of the hospital that we felt comfortable with. So we sort of Mm -hmm. resigned ourselves to the fact that we were going to have to go in. And I started back into therapy to try to get to the point where I could be in that environment without having that past Mm -hmm. trauma come up. Because as you you Mm -hmm. alluded to earlier, if you're stressed, it's going to affect how your labor goes. So something a lot of people don't know is that when you're having twins, there's procedures that the hospital likes to follow. There's a particular way they like twin labors to go, and there's a way that they want to do things, and pretty much none of that was going to work for me. So we had a lot of serious discussion with the hospital to find out what they could do to try to prevent me from having a traumatic experience due to the history that I have, and they did. I cannot say enough about Columbia St. Mary's staff. There were meetings with the head of or representative of every department that would have been involved with this birth. We met with OB, nursing, anesthesiology, neonatology, risk management, and they accommodated everything we asked for, some of which was unprecedented Mm -hmm. at that hospital. So they stretched themselves in a way that I never would have thought a hospital would. And looking back on it, I can say I had a great birth, which I never in a million years Mm -hmm. thought I would be able to say about a hospital birth after my first one. So even not having the home birth, I can still say that it was a good birth because of everything they did. Well, it sounds to me like they really listened to you. They listened to what was important to you, and instead of saying, well, this is the way we've always done it, they paid attention to why it was that you wanted to do things a little differently, and they said, okay. Exactly, and I've been in communication with some of the people at the hospital, and they've said, we remember you. We remember you as a model of what we can do that's different and that we don't always have to do it the same way and we can look at each case by itself. And so affecting Mm -hmm. that change there was something that makes me very happy about. 
Well, that's great because then this is the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a care team. <laughs> You're supposed right. to be part of that care team. And it sounds to me like there was a lot of give and take. And that's what you need to be able to relax, to have a good birth experience. Giving birth is the hardest work a woman ever has to do. I mean, they don't call it labor for nothing. It's really a Absolutely. difficult thing. And knowing that you're going to have two and knowing that if there are going to be problems, there are two babies plus you. There are three patients involved, not just the two, as if two isn't enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right, And that it's not uncommon for twins to have some kinds of complications. So I think that this hospital is to be commended, that they really listened to you and wanted you to be part of the care team. And they wanted to make it the best experience they could for you. So, wow, that's the way it should always be. And I think, though, they were probably really impressed, Kathy, that you knew exactly what you wanted. So many moms don't really have a clue. I mean, especially first-time moms, we don't know what we're getting into the very first time we have a baby. We're just right. hoping that we can really get that thing out of us. <laughs> oh, I was like, that was my first one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm like, I had to keep one. telling them was, this isn't my first rodeo. I know what works right. for me, what doesn't. How can we come together and make this work? And they were phenomenal about that. They really were. Yeah. And I'm so yeah. appreciative for that. Wow. So it seems, though, that... There were certain things that went wrong that in the end turned out to be what was right for you. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? You know, we had all these hiccups in the process of my pregnancy where we thought we had something set up and then it kind of fell through and we had to work out and hammer out all of these details. And I'm going to be honest, even with all of the assurances that we had from the staff and all of the planning and all the preparation, I was still not entirely thrilled about being in the hospital because sure. it was still a hospital. It wasn't home. We did not know he had a defect. I mean, he was born, and he was born first, and I had him on me for a few minutes, and the cord stopped, and they cut the cord, and I handed him off to my husband, and I had his brother, and they were seven minutes apart, and I got both of them back on me. I'm looking between the two of them, and I said, you know, he looks really blue, and the nurse said, yeah, he does. We're going to take him over and give him some oxygen, and they took him over to the warmer on the side of the room, and within about five minutes of that, the neonatologist came over to me and said, we need to take him upstairs. And so they took him up to the NICU and tried several different things. He had a hole in one lung. He had an air pocket around his left lung, a pneumothorax, and they drained that, and it didn't help. He was still bluish. He was still not oxygenating his blood. And that's when the neonatologist said, I think he has a heart defect. I think I know what it is, and he needs to go to Children's Hospital, Wisconsin. And so he called oh, for a wow. transport when Ethan was four hours old. Ethan got over to children when he was about eight hours old and within three hours was in surgery that was having emergency open heart surgery so we had no idea it all happened very fast and so that was a struggle for us just trying to keep up with everything and I think sure. you know we talked about how good Columbia St. Mary's was had they not been so good at helping me to have a good experience there I would have had hospital trauma in addition to my child is really sick trauma. And so I was, right. I was very grateful that that happened. But looking mm -hmm. back on it, I realized that because we were already there, it made the transition of him getting into the NICU so much smoother and less chaotic on everybody because we were already there. Transferring him in from home would have been a frantic car ride for everybody involved, and there would have been having to get his history and records and all of this stuff, trying to coordinate it all to get him into the NICU versus him just being able to put in the bassinet and up to the third floor. And I'm looking at the whole picture now. I can see that there's a lot of not onlys. In staying with the theme of the show, more miraculous. Not only were we in a hospital that had a level 3 NICU, we had a neonatologist that had seen a TAPVR before which I think mm -hmm. helped him recognize it quickly and get him mm -hmm. off to where he needed to be to get the help that he needed. He said, I've only had one other of these in several years, but this is what I think it is. Not only did Ethan go to a hospital that could fix his heart, he went to one of the best heart hospitals in the country. Wow. And so we were, we were blessed that we lived where we lived and we were so close to children. Not only did he have amazing surgeons working on him, his after-surgery care was fantastic. All of the doctors, the mm -hmm. nurses, the therapists, they were awesome, and they took wonderful care of him, and they took care of us. And if they hadn't mm -hmm. been so good, the whole thing would have been even more traumatic. And that's not to say it wasn't traumatic, because it was, but it could have been a lot harder mm -hmm. had all of those pieces not fallen into place. So now, a year plus out from it, I can look at all that turmoil that happened during my pregnancy and that happened during that initial part of the birth, and I can say it needed to happen the way that it did in order for us to still have Ethan with us. Mm -hmm. 
I love that, all the not onlys. <laughs> that's a really interesting <laughs> way to look at it. No, that's really, that's very insightful, don't you think? Well, I thought it up, so that might be bragging. <laughs> <laughs> if I say that I do. Oh, that's what I love about you, Kathy. <laughs> well, and that's, right, when I was thinking about this, I kept saying, well, yeah, not only that, but it was this, and not only that, but it was this. And it mm-hmm. keeps cleaning up that way, so I said, let's coin a new phrase, the not only. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it because it <laughs> lets you look at your whole experience in a different light, don't you think? Absolutely. And it because really it, helps you to it, appreciate... Yeah, I mean, it's not just one thing. It was almost like a snowball effect. Not only did one midwife say no to you, but then another one. <laughs> not only mm-hmm. did she say yes and then cancel on you, but then you had to find another yep. place. And, you, and I mean, yeah, yeah and you're was, right. Yeah, it was, we don't think we can do that. Well, okay, we'll go ask if we can do that. And, well, we have to get this person's right. approval and this person's approval and this person's approval. And then the fact that we had a neonatologist that had seen a TPVR before was, in my mind, just beyond strange because there aren't that many of them out there. There um, aren't. And, there aren't. And, and he was wonderful. I mean, he was wonderful mm-hmm. when he realized that it was beyond his scope to be able to care for there. He said he's got to go. Right. And so it was just, there, there were just no so hesitation. many little pieces. Right. There were just right. so many little pieces that fell into place exactly the way they needed to be for us to still have him here. And that's that's been just amazing for me to kind of look back and realize Yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. It makes you so grateful for all of those hiccups, as you said. You had all these hiccups, but they were all there for a reason. It was part of a bigger plan, and that bigger plan instilled hope that Ethan would make it. I mean, he was given the best opportunity possible. Well, we need to take a quick commercial break, but don't leave yet because when we come back, Kathy will give us some advice that she has for other mothers who might be expecting twins, especially if they know that one of the twins will be born with a congenital heart defect. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today our topic is a twin miracle, and today's guest is Kathy Kolodinsky. And we just finished talking with Kathy about the miracle not only of birth, but of Ethan's special miracle where his birth involves so much more than what most babies' births do because not only did he go through the trauma of being born, but then he also had open heart surgery within the first 24 hours of life, which just is amazing. But I want to talk to Kathy now about how Ethan is doing today. So, Kathy, having twins all by itself seems like a bit of a miracle, even though some of the research that I did made me see that it's actually a little bit more common than I thought it was. But one thing seems true, and that is that it's not uncommon for twins to be born prematurely, for them to have developmental issues, and now having a baby with a critical congenital heart defect, you know that that's true for them as well, that they frequently have developmental issues and have other kinds of problems. So tell us how Ethan is doing. We know he has celebrated his first birthday, so that's really exciting. How is he doing compared to his heart-healthy brother, Lucas? Yes, he did have his first birthday. They are actually almost 14 months now, and that was a fun day. And yes, a lot of twins are born prematurely. Thankfully, we didn't have that issue with Ethan. I had worked very hard in my pregnancy to keep them in as long as possible, and it seemed to have worked. I broke my OB's record for longest gestating twin mom. And if he had <laughs> had the typical, you know, if he had had the typical lung, and yeah, he told me that, and he just thought it was the strangest thing ever. If he had had the typical breathing issues that preemie twins have, I don't know that he would have done as well. So I'm very glad Mm -hmm. that I kept him in until 39 weeks. Really, the only thing he has working against him right now is the congenital heart defect he was born with. He actually had a Mm -hmm. developmental eval at 13 months. And if you want the heart numbers, his talking was evaluated at 11 months. Neither of the boys are big talkers. They're both kind of quiet, but they're not concerned with that at all. You know, they're not talking speech therapy or anything like that. No, that's really not bad at all. 
Yeah, his understanding of verbal communication was at 13 months, so right where he should be. Oh, wow. Um, and then his logic and his gross motor and his fine motor skills were all 15 to 16 months. So he's actually ahead oh of the game gosh. in that regard. That's great. Yeah, and Lucas is right there with him. They're doing pretty much the same things. Getting there was very different, however. Lucas tends to do the mastery of the gross motor skills first, rolling over, sitting up, crawling. He's the more physical of the two of them. And Ethan tends to be the more contemplative, methodical, thoughtful, going to figure out how this works baby. It's very interesting to see the differences between the two of them and they're at an age now where they're interacting with each other and mm-hmm. I would honestly raise my hand and say that they were plotting things already. Um, <laughs> but, but there are a lot of they are. They are. They will figure out how to get that clothes basket full of diapers tipped over and they're, <laughs> they're little schemers. So it's a lot of fun to see their personalities starting to come out and see their differences. Yeah, yeah, that's so neat. And so apparently there's no problem with the twins communicating with each other if they're already scheming and plotting together. (laughs) Yeah, they do. Some people might argue with me, but I think they do. (laughs) Well, I've heard that twins sometimes develop their own language. They have twin speak. Have you noticed that yet? They're still really young, but have you noticed where they maybe have their own special words for each other for certain things? If they have special words for each other, it consists of screaming because it's it's usually one wants, it's usually one wants the cabinet door open and the other one wants the cabinet door closed. So they'll both be pushing on it from opposite directions, just kind of yelling at each other. Or one wants the beads in the bucket and the other one wants the beads out of the bucket. So I don't necessarily, we think we have formed words, but they definitely let each other know their displeasure. Right. It sounds like they're able to get across what it is that they're thinking or wanting. It may not be they in a do. way that makes mommy happy. <laughs> well, this I sounds, it. though, like what probably all moms of twins go through. I'm pretty sure this sounds totally normal. I've had a number of friends who have had twins, and twins actually run in my family, so I was ah. expecting to have twins myself because it skips a generation. So my grandfather mm-hmm. was a twin, and his grandfather was a twin, and I was wow. kind of surprised. Both times I got so big, I thought for sure there had to be twins inside of me, but there weren't. <laughs> it was just a really big singleton. <laughs> I'm a small woman. But I'm wondering what kind of advice you could offer other mothers of twins, I mean, it seems to me, wow, your OB said that you had the record for keeping the twins in the longest. I know that's one of the problems is that the gestation frequently isn't as long as what they want them to be. So what was your magic secret? One of my midwives said to me, if a twin mom still enjoys food, she's not doing pregnancy right. And she wasn't kidding. Uh I, I hated food by the time I was about three months pregnant. Nutrition it can, I'm not saying that it always does because there's a lot of other factors that can go into a mom when she's carrying two babies versus one. But nutrition can play a big part in how long those babies stay in. So research that. Get information on protein intake, vitamin C, vitamin, you know, taking iron. And those are the things that I did. I ate large quantities of protein. I took a vitamin C supplement that had bioflavonoids in it. And I took a food-based iron supplement. And I drank lots of water. Lots and lots yeah. of water. And I carried them to 39 weeks. And I know a number of friends that have had twins, and they all had the same midwives I did and carried their babies past the typical time slot when my OB would have expected them to come. You already had other children. It's not like you were laying Mm -hmm. home flat on your back. You were a very active mother. Right. Probably more active than most moms. Yeah, we we actually wound up moving into a new house the day I went into labor with them. Packing and I didn't have the ability to be slowed down. <laughs> I had too much to do. Yeah. I mean, when you told me your story, I was just amazed at everything that you were doing, all of the children that you were homeschooling and taking care of while you were pregnant with twins. And the fact that you were able to keep them to 39 weeks, that's pretty amazing. And who would think that the one thing that you point to is nutrition? I mean, That's pretty phenomenal to me because that's something that we can control. So, wow. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to take another quick commercial break, and then when we come back, we're only going to have about a minute or two left, but I would really love to talk to Kathy a little bit more about Ethan's heart defect, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, because that is something that we don't get to talk about very much. So we'll be back in just a moment. 
Hannah Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Our topic today is a twin miracle, and our guest is Kathy Kolodinsky. And we've had a great show talking about twins, how to have a healthy twin birth, the miracle of Ethan's birth, and what happens when you have an undiagnosed congenital heart defect with a twin. And that's what I'd like to focus on in this last little bit that we have, and that is talking about Ethan's specific congenital heart defect, which is total anomalous pulmonary venous return, which, oh my goodness, is that enough of a mouthful to say. It's also a fairly rare heart defect, and there aren't a whole lot of adults that I know of who have it, but the ones that I do know have actually been able to lead fairly normal lives. So, Kathy, tell us how Ethan is going. You said that as far as development, he seems to be doing pretty well and that it is only his heart defect right now that you're still focusing on. But tell us what the doctors have said regarding his future, regarding his heart defect. He had an echocardiogram. Ironically, it was exactly a year to the day from when he had his surgery. So that was kind of an emotional day for us. And it could not have looked better. His cardiologist said if you showed it to someone who didn't know his history, they would think they were looking at a normal heart. PAPBRs are a rare defect in that they're only about 1% of congenital heart defects, but they have some of the best outcomes. His odds of ever needing another surgery are a little tough to nail down because there aren't enough babies with only PAPBRs to have a good enough sample size because it's usually seen in conjunction with other defects, and the long-term data isn't really there yet for the surgical technique that they used on him. They used something called a sutureless repair. But for all the babies with this defect, including kids with additional defects, the estimate for him ever needing another surgery is 2 to 4%, which are really great odds. We've been told that he should live a totally normal life. We don't have to treat him any differently than we treat his twin brother. So that's pretty much what we plan to do. That's wonderful. That's such great news. And it's such a different outcome than you might have expected having given birth, looking at a blue baby, being told that he had to be whisked to the NICU only to have to be whisked to another hospital so far away from you. I'm sure that your heart was in your throat. I'm sure that you were so afraid of what the future would hold for your baby. But wow, I mean, you can't get much better prognosis than what you just told me. No, you can't. And I feel incredibly blessed in that we were so lucky to get where we are. There's a lot of heart parents that don't get to be where I am. And it's a strange place to be where your heart baby kind of isn't a heart baby anymore. And so I kind of struggle with that a little bit. It's something akin to survivor's guilt, I guess you could say, Uh um, because it was scary. And we just didn't know. We had no idea what a world we were getting thrust into when we were told, your baby has a heart defect. And so for us to come out on the other side of all of that with him being essentially normal is a miracle. It is a miracle. And that's why I wanted you on the show today because I thought you had such a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us today, Kathy. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to share it. Well, I just love it. It's a beautiful story, and that does conclude the first episode of Season 5. I'm so happy everybody got a chance to come back and listen to such a beautiful story for us to start out Season 5. So thank you for listening today. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern Time for a brand new episode. During the month of February, also known as Heart Month, Heart to Heart with Anna will broadcast a show every day. On Tuesdays, we'll have a brand new show featuring our theme for Season 7, Congenital Heart Defects Around the Globe. The other days will be encore presentations with a brand new intro. If you'd like to know what shows will be featured, you can check out our website at www.hearttoheartwithanna.com. Please find and like us on Facebook. Check out our Café Press Boutique Revenue from the Café Press Boutique helps to defray the cost of this radio show. Follow our radio show on Blog Talk Radio and especially on Spreaker. 
Once we get to 100 followers on Spreaker, we can petition iHeartRadio to carry our show, and then people can listen to Heart to Heart with Anna in their cars. Thanks again for listening. We know that congenital heart defects touch people all over the globe. So remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week.